Hey everyone, I'm Nishal, and this talk is about securing Coinbase's edge payments uh, infrastructure. If you attended my coworker's talk uh, previously, Mark, he talked about hacking cryptocurrencies. I work on the other side of things, integrating Coinbase's systems with traditional banking networks. So today, I'll quickly introduce myself, what I work on at Coinbase, what is Coinbase, how do we define security in payments networks, uh, privacy in payments, and the trade-offs we make in the current financial systems, payment networks as a whole, how do we threat model them, how do we think about these in the security context, and then how do we apply the common tools uh, that we have in AppSec into the payments world, right? So things like security champions or bug bounty programs, and how do we think about these things in this new realm? And we'll have a conclusion with some final remarks. So briefly, uh, I'm Nishal. I'm on the AppSec team at Coinbase. I work on Salus, which is an open source uh, security scanning orchestration tool. I also work on a lot with uh, the fiat payment systems, which is what this talk is about. If you don't know what Coinbase is, Coinbase is a digital currency exchange. It allows you to bring US dollars or pounds or euros or other currencies and to buy Bitcoin uh, and other digital assets. So the definition of secure in payments, right? There's two goals that at least when I'm thinking about payment networks, I want to achieve when integrating against payments. Minimize money loss. And you might be thinking, why not no money loss? Well, that's a good question, and we're going to answer that in a, in a, in a good second. And the second one we want, to limit, we want to achieve is no data loss, right? We don't want to leak people's uh, personal information. And you may be thinking this is a talk on payment networks. Where does personal information come into play? And we'll go into that also. But the point is, right, when we're thinking, when we're coming from the AppSec world, the most serious thing that we may see is a cross-site scripting attack, a C-serve, you know, remote code execution. In a payments context, what do we care about? We care about not losing money. Um, and so does, sometimes we try to apply these categories into maybe what are more business logic bugs. And so as a security team, do we say we really care that these AppSec sort of bugs don't apply in the, in the payments world and this is more of a business logic bug and so we wash our hands and say this is not our responsibility? Or do we say as a security team, we really do care about any bug that loses the company money? Um, and Coinbase chose the former, where we really do care, we consider any bug that loses money a security bug, even if it falls under the business logic uh, bucket. So here, I'm gonna quickly talk about KYC ML and privacy, and kind of how privacy is impacted in the current financial system. KYC stands for Know Your Customer. It's a control that often goes hand in hand with identity verification. So this might be you know, handing your bank your driver's license um, and they do some background checks on you. Uh, and anti-money laundering is AML, abbreviated as AML. And this is why uh, financial institutions have to perform KYC, right? It's to, it's to prevent money laundering through the financial system. And so how is privacy impacted? So let's go take an example. We have Garfield here on the left-hand side. And they have, we have a merchant and Garfield's trying to send you know, the money, some money to this merchant. So what happens? Garfield hands some bag of cash to what's called the originating bank. So this could be Garfield's bank, this your, your Chase's, your Wells Fargo's, um, right? They send that, that money gets sent to a, a middle bank, a middleman called a correspondent bank. And what is sent in this, in this transaction? Usually it's the transaction that wants to be sent, but also data about Garfield uh, themselves. Right? This may include things like the name, a physical address, date of birth, uh, usually some identifying number. So this could be your driver's license number, this could be your passport number, something of that sort. That's also sent with the transaction information. That gets sent to the receiving bank, which is the merchant's bank, and then that same data is sent over to the merchant. Right? And so if you're looking at this, you're like, I have the transaction, but also like this very sensitive data about a person is not only sent to the merchant or just to these two banks, that's the Merchants Bank or, my, or Garfield's Bank, but these really these middle banks that are operating on much bigger scales. Banks you don't even know that you're working with, right? And a lot of times these systems may look automated on the surface, but they're really not. There's often a lot of different people at each of these banks performing manual KYC checks, understanding the risk profiles of customers. And when I talk about risk profiles in this context, I'm talking about risk to money laundering, right? So you could imagine online gambling sites are much riskier businesses for banks uh, to, funnel, like, to perform money laundering activities through. And so what ends up happening is banks start, end up choosing their customer based on the riskiness of their business to money laundering. 
And how this impacts privacy is you can see that just sort of this very personal information gets sent throughout this entire chain. What also happens is there's two banking laws that primarily govern uh, US transactions. First is the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970 and the US Patriot Act that was implemented uh, in the wake of 9-11. And both of those require uh, any transactions over $10,000 to be reported to the federal government. Um, and that is just what happens. So you're like, okay, well, I don't want my transactions to be reported to the federal government or to any federal agency. So I'm gonna send $9,999.99. .99 99 so what happens? Well, there's another type of report, which is more onerous. It's called the SAR, Suspicious, Suspicious Activity Report. And it's what banks file against customers, their own customers, telling the federal government, hey, I believe there's a certain transaction that looks suspicious of money laundering. And what happens here is like if you ask your bank, hey, did you file a SAR on me? They may file another SAR for you asking about the SAR. And they can't actually tell you. It's, they're criminally uh, liable if they tell you that they filed a SAR. So one, you don't even know what banks are telling the federal government, uh, and they can't even tell you, right? This is, this is like encoded in law since the 70s. So what ends up happening um, is a company that tries to operate within the traditional financial sector has to either abide by these rules or you're not allowed to access the banking system, right? So you're really placed in this weird, even if you want to be privacy conscious as a merchant, in order to play by the rules, you have to follow these bank rules. Otherwise, they won't serve you as a customer. Right? So this is why you'll see cryptocurrency exchanges and other types of financial institutions really require your identity. Right? And if you're even a bigger customer, they may even do more enhanced background checks. Where are you getting your source of funds for? Right? They don't only just care about the amount of money you have, they care about the source of that income. And I don't, I, I'm not up here to put up my personal opinions on whether the system is good or bad, but these are the privacy costs that we actually have in today's systems, right? Even, and you may be saying, I never work on these systems, right? If you have payroll, right? If you get direct deposit in, through your company, you, you are a participant in this system. So all your people, you know, all your business folks at your company are like, yes, we want to accept payments. And they all imagine that customers are lining up with wads of cash to hand your business so you can sell your services, right? And that's, that's usually what happens. And then you as a security engineer at your company are like, hold up, what's actually important here? Uh, what do we need to think about before integrating against the system, right? It's the same sort of thought process you may have, like, hey, we have another vendor. What do we actually need to consider when integrating against this vendor? And so there are three things that I believe are kind of the most important uh, when integrating its payment networks. The first is payment guarantees. Are you actually guaranteed to be paid when the payment network says you're paid? Um, that may seem like an obvious question to be yes, but the answer in most cases is actually no. Uh, customer disputes, right? How does a customer say that a transaction was fraudulent and what recourse do they have? Because then that tells you as a business what happens when that mechanism is abused, right? If a customer claims that a transaction is fraudulent but isn't actually what recourse does a business have to say, no, this customer is lying that it was fraudulent, it was actually enacted by the customer. And settlement time, right? You would think that payments are instantaneous in today's day and age, but if you've ever moved money you know, to your 401k or to your brokerage to buy stock, you're like, I have to wait three to five business days? Like, what the heck is going on? So we'll take a look there, right? So it's not necessarily that all payments are instantaneous, right? They take time. And why do they take time and what happens in that time? And that's what we're gonna take a look at in a couple of examples. So three main ideas when we're looking at payment networks, right? And this is, goes away from the traditional uh, AppSec sort of bugs, but when we're thinking about payment networks, it's similar to the browser, right? When we look at browsers, there's two fundamental concepts. It's like the same origin policy and you have mixing of content and code. And that's like most of the issues in browsers, right? It sort of stems from that. And right, we take the same sort of first principles approach with payment networks, like what are the things we're really concerned about here, and then figure out the security model based on that. So here, there's two types of uh, payment networks in general, what I'll refer to as pull-based payments and push-based payments, and then we'll go into specific examples of a couple of networks. Uh, what I'm gonna first define is a pull-based payment network. These are just two broad categories, uh, and I'll, we'll go over that. So Garfield here is trying to purchase some lasagna as his favorite food. So what does he do? He has his credit card, right? And this is mostly in a US-based context. You can even think of going to the store, e-commerce sites in the US. I have my card. I give my card information to the merchant. 
the merchant like, sends that data to some payment processor to a bank, and the bank says, like, looks good, right? Here's your, here's your money. And then the, pay, the, the merchant sends the lasagna back to Garfield. So from, a, from a, the perspective of a security engineer, you may be looking at this and saying, like, what actually has authenticated this payment? Right? It's pretty much only the data in the card. Right? What, is, what is private here that has actually authenticated this payment? There's really nothing. And I'll go, let's take a deeper look. So first, if you've heard of ACH, uh, this is the most common uh, payment network in the US besides cards. It's how you get direct deposit through your salary or payroll. It's how you move money through the brokerage accounts um, and moves a lot of money in the US economy. And it stands for the Auto, uh, Automated Clearinghouse, just generally referred to as ACH. So here, uh, generally, you can think of it as a check. Uh, the check goes through the ACH system. Also, if, you ever, if you've ever written a check. And what happens here? So the check gets written to the shop or to the merchant. That, you know, maybe that check is converted to a digital check, sent to the bank, and the bank is like, looks good. Here's the money. And the merchant receives the money, sells the money. Now you're thinking as a security engineer, what has authenticated this check? My signature? I don't think so, right? How many times you go to those square iPads at a food truck and you like, sign as a smiley face, right? It doesn't matter, like, it's not, it's, not, it's not your signature. So what's authenticating this payment? It's the routing number and the account number at the bottom of the check. That's every check you've ever written, right? That is the only thing that actually authenticates your payment, saying that this is a valid payment. So there's no secret information here, it's all public information. So, so what I am saying is all you really need to drain a person's bank account, yes, is the routing and checking number, routing and account number listed at the bottom of a check that you hand to any merchant. So yeah, it, it is pretty surprising. Um, so you can think about, okay, so this is prone to abuse. So like, there must be some things that are protecting the system, like otherwise it shouldn't really exist, right? We would have beaten it, beaten it to the ground by now. And so yes, there's fraud in this system, and we'll go over like how those various ways of fraud happen, and like how they come into the security context. And so you can imagine, right, with the ACH network, this is often what banks will say. It's like, hey, don't worry. If you ever see a fraudulent transaction, call up your bank to reverse the payment, right? So that's sort of the mitigation you can think about as why you can't just drain a person's bank account is because me as a customer of this bank saying this, this transaction was fraudulent, and then the bank will reverse it for me. And so like, why is that the case? So we're gonna go take a look at the ACH network itself and how does money move in this system? So Garfield has a customer of this little bank. Little bank may go, money gets funneled to some bigger bank, even a bigger bank. And then there's the Federal Reserve, right? This is the big uh, pseudo government agency. Um, it's really a private bank and they're playing traffic cop with this network. Then they wrap those payments down and say to the merchant's bank finally, and then it finally gets to the merchant, right? So it goes through this. So what's interesting is that this system was built in the 1970s, before email. So now if you're, if you're building this system back then, you don't have email, you know, no cell phones, you're on landlines, how do you coordinate payments? How do I say I have 100 payments today and I need to send them, right? Because this bank doesn't just serve Garfield, it may serve 100 other customers. So how do you route these payments in some sort of coordinated way so that the system actually flows and ends up in the correct account? So what ends up happening is they create what's called settlement times. It's basically a time that says you have to submit your payments by noon every day. If you don't, we're not gonna process it until the next day, right? That, that is how they coordinate payments. And they still do that today. Uh, you may have heard of a thing called same day ACH. All they did was instead of saying there's one time to settle payments, there's now three times. Uh, it's really not instantaneous, right? Because they still go through this network of banks up to the Federal Reserve and then back down. What's also interesting is the, file, the files that actually get sent through this bank. So if you remember from a privacy context, it's not just the transaction data, right? It's a lot of information about each individual person initiating a transaction. So what ends up happening is there's a file. It's called the NACHA file. It's an XML-based file. And you would say, okay, 1970s, I guess, makes sense. And this file contains the transaction information, a lot of this personal information also about each of the originating customers. And from there, each bank may process, may, may receive and send the files uh, in some sort of automated way. 
But oftentimes what ends up happening is banks will hire armies of payments analysts or payments people to edit these XML files by hand. Uh, and what ends up happening as the merchant is you run into a lot of data quality issues that actually affect what, what the end, end file you receive, right? Even though the spec is defined, what is in those fields is not very well defined. And you run into all sorts of issues as a merchant in trying to process these payments. Because you could imagine if the bank starts switching around who the actual sender is with another field, and then you are trying to build a system against that, the data quality isn't there to actually support building an automated system throughout this entire uh, pipeline. So back to ACH. So we're talking about, right, so there's, there's various ways of doing fraud in the system. And we'll, we'll go over kind of how those exist. So Garfield's writing a check. Instead of a merchant, we have a hacker man or attacker woman. We have the hacker. And from here, the hacker or the attacker moves, takes that check. Maybe, you know, this is a malicious merchant. They move, they ask the bank, like, hey, I got this check. Please uh, give me money. Bank's like, yep, you told me to give you $50. I gave you 50 bucks. Sounds good. Um, and what ends up happening is because you gave the creds to your bank account, because it's only the routing and account number, they could pull whatever uh, amount of money they want and run away with it. The only the thing that does protect you is you can call up your bank to reverse it, right? Not just days, but months and like weeks and months later. What's interesting though, uh, particularly is ACH fraud against a merchant, right? So in this case, we have the customer acting maliciously. There was more malicious intent. So they, the, the, the hacker writes a, or the attacker writes a check. Merchant's like, everything looks good. So I send it over, bank gives me my money. Lasagna is sent back. What happens afterwards? Bank, the, 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 the attacker uses the same mechanism from the previous example. Instead to say this is a fraudulent transaction, they, they, say, they tell the bank this is a fraudulent transaction, but it wasn't in this case. It was, uh, it was something that the attacker actually initiated, but was, is using this mechanism of calling the bank to reverse a payment as the way to commit fraud against the merchant. Right? And so now the merchant's left holding the bank, is left holding the bag. Right? Because now the bank reverses this transaction, they've already sold the lasagna, and what does the merchant have to show for their goods that they've sold? There's not much. So the question is, is this a security concern? Right? If the point of integrating a payment network is necessarily to eliminate money loss, then yeah, it would be, right? But an original definition is, is to minimize money loss. So there are times when we say, you know, we're going to have to take some amount of fraud in the system. And then that's up to usually security teams to talk to the business saying, this is a risk. It's not one we're equipped to handle. And what most companies end up doing is just hiring huge amounts of ML teams to do fraud detection or hiring a vendor to do this. So why even accept ACH, just as a quick question? Right? Why not take cards or any other sort of payment network? Why stick to this 1970s technology? So in the top, it's a little small uh, here, but in the orange is at the top is number of ACH, uh, number of payments, and the bottom is card payments in blue. And so you see, and then the, on the bottom, it's volume. So you can see the transaction volume for ACH is about one-fifth of the number of transactions, but yet produces about seven times more volume in actual dollars, right? So this is important as a business, you were like, your business people are gonna be like, yes, we need to integrate at ACH, because this is how we take, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of dollars of transactions that aren't available on card systems, right? So this is, we're sort of stuck in the business requires us to integrate against this payment network, but yet there's these like elements of fraud in the system, and so how do we, how, how, how do we help here? Like we're just sort of at a loss, right? Like we're, we're stuck with a system that isn't very good, but yet is like almost a necessary use case to integrate with. So let's think about this. So what are some mitigations that have come out in recent years? So maybe, maybe if we can create a way to authenticate a payment. Might be, this might be the solution. So attacker writes their check, and then the shop is like, wait, we know checks are bad. 
so we want you to prove that you own the account by authenticating some way. What ends up happening is then the attacker is required to give up creds to their bank account, right? This would be your banking login and password, right? To the merchant, not to your bank, to your merchant. The merchant then attempts to log in on behalf of you and says, is, does this person actually own this account and routing number? And the bank is like, yep, sounds good. And then forward on the check, can't let it go, and then get bags of cash. And then lasagna is sent back and the attacker is thwarted because we've proved that they've owned account ownership. But if you're sort of a, if you're any security person and you've been paying attention, you might be like, I just gave up creds to my bank account, right? And this is the problem, right? Uh, you proved account ownership, but you gave up creds. And what's interesting here is that there's, there's a couple of companies who I won't name, it's like, this is their business model that they sell to merchants. Um, and likely, and as I was doing some research, handing over your passwords to your bank account uh, violates your bank's terms of service. And what violating that means is means you're no longer, uh, you no longer have fraud protections from your bank because they said, you've given up your password. How can we be, as a business, ensure that we can guarantee that these, these payments were fraudulent or were not fraudulent? So they say, by giving up your password to a third party, uh, you violated the terms of service of your bank and you're no longer eligible for fraud protections. How this plays out in practice, I don't think it's actually super enforced, but you know, it's legal jargon if their lawyers wanna come after you, like they have, that's something you, we've all agreed to by signing up with these bank accounts. And so, right, and even, and even part of this sort of, is part of this system where of calling the bank and reversing a fraudulent transaction is actually encoded into federal law. Um, it's not just like banks can, can turn that off. And so the current system now works for merchants, works for banks because they no longer have this like risk and liability, but it really sucks for the consumers, right? We've just transferred the risk. We've just moved the risk around to users and we've left it there. And you might be thinking, why not use OAuth, right? We've built OAuth, we've been using it everywhere else in the world, why not use OAuth here? Uh, what's interesting is that OAuth is starting to be implemented by like the bigger banks uh, and it's, but at the same time, the problem is only these bigger banks are using it. And, and what ends up happening is that when most people bank with their like local credit unions or smaller banks that don't have the technology resources to implement OAuth, then what ends up happening is you're actually just giving up your banking creds to these like third parties. Um, and, it's, and you would think like, oh, maybe there's some like special APIs they hit in the back, back end. No, it's literally you know, server side scraping or client side scraping. Like that is what we're using in like today's world for banking integrations, right? They will just download the HTML, parse it, and hope they get the right information. That is what they're doing uh, in most cases. Sometimes some banks are a little bit better and they have like private contracts negotiated between the two parties and they'll say, oh, we'll like open up this SFTP bucket and you just tell us what customer's data you need and we just give it to you. So, right, a um, lot of, well, there's a lot of issues here. Um, but. And then from the banking side, it's like, okay, why not implement OAuth? It's so easy. Well, the issue with that is there's been a lot of cases where banks have tried to Im like improve or implement new auth mechanisms, and they've just taken down the banking website. Uh, this happened to one example in similar vein is JP Morgan and Chase had an incident where they were implementing a new feature. And instead of when you logged in, you would expect to log into your own account, but they logged you into another person's account. Um, so that, that's the risk they face, right? By trying to change these auth mechanisms, you expose risk elsewhere. Uh, TD Bank, I believe is an arm of TD Ameritrade. Uh, they were upgrading uh, their auth systems and they took down their banking site for seven days. So you can imagine as a customer, not having access to your banking site for seven days would piss you off. Um, and so, and right, so now you're like stuck. Okay, we wanna use OAuth, but we can't because if we do, we might screw everything up and that's really bad. So now you're just really stuck. So you think about like cards, are they better? No, they're like the same. Um, it's equally as bad. Uh, there's some better stuff with, it, it obviously uh, settles faster, right? They're, they're more, a little bit more instantaneous with Visa and MasterCard AMX Discover. Uh, but right, the only thing that authenticates your payment is like the CVV, the account number, um, and expiry date, which is all the stuff on the credit card. And you might be like, oh, we added chip, but like 
when you have the chip, like, and you go to Amazon, you don't type anything from the chip on there. Um, like, the chip is just sort of a security magic for the most part. Uh, it does help with physical transactions, but, I mean, e-commerce is sort of what most people do these days, so it doesn't actually help us. So what we're going to do is go over another type of network. I mentioned there was two. It was pull-based, right? And so most US systems have this sort of pull-based interaction where the merchant's pulling money out of your account. Uh, and the rest of the world has figured out how to do this better. Um, and they have a push-based uh, payment system. And so what that looks like is uh, I basically send a message to my bank saying, hey, please pay the merchant on behalf of me. And the, merchant pays the, uh, the bank pays the merchant. This is much saner. Uh, there's no credential sharing, none of this craziness that happens. Um, so let's look, at, let's look at a case study and actually threat model one of these. So 3DS card flows. This is a typical card flow that I've seen in uh, Canada, Europe, most of Asia, basically everywhere except the US, Latin America, South America, like literally everybody except the US has implemented this. Um, and so what happens here in this payment flow at a high level, and we'll go into detail, is I give my card to the bank, I mean to the merchant, excuse me. The merchant is like, hold on, I'm not going to process this. I'm going to give, send you to the bank, go to the bank um, and figure out this transaction because I'm not going to like, authorize this on behalf of you. So then you go to the bank and you're like, approve transaction, right? So the bank is, you go to the bank to initiate this transaction. And then the bank hands the money to the uh, merchant. And then you get your lasagna. And then the hacker is thwarted because there's, there's, like, there's very little fraud. Like you had to prove to the bank you own this by typing in your username and password, maybe some 2FA code. So let's actually deep, deep dive into like how these flows actually work um, and all of the things that can still go wrong in this flow. So here I have my card uh, handed over to the merchant. The merchant is usually working with some sort of payment processor here represented by like a traffic cop because oftentimes their entire job here is just to redirect where the user is going between the merchant and the bank. And so this payment processor is being asked by the merchant, you know, is this a 3DS card? Is this, is, or is this a US card, right? In this case, we'll say it's a 3DS card. So please take a detour to your bank. Please be redirected to your bank. You get redirected. Uh, so the bank gets this redirect, I mean, the merchant gets the redirect URL, then the end user gets the redirect URL back from the bank, then is get sent, gets sent to the bank, and then at their bank, they type in their creds, the username, password, maybe a 2FA code to authorize the transaction. Then the money, uh, as an asynchronous process, the money uh, is starting to move between the bank and the payment processor. And then it goes from the payment processor back to the merchant. But the user is still stuck on the banking site. So what happens now? The bank says, please go back to the payment processor. The payment process, and the user is, says, okay, I'm going to the payment processor. Go to the payment processor. The payment processor says, okay, go back to the merchant. We need to finish up this transaction. Then the user goes back to the merchant. And then the merchant's like, yep, I got the money. Here you go, right? No creds were shared with creds where, where creds shouldn't be shared. Um, this is a much saner system, except for like the fact you're just kind of bouncing around between these multiple systems, but overall seems pretty reasonable, right? But there are lots of things uh, that can go wrong, right? It's like redirections. Um, how do you actually authenticate you got a success on this money case? Um, you can think of this flow as like very similar to PayPal. Uh, if you use like PayPal checkout, um, PayPal is very close to a push payment um, and they've modeled uh, their check out flows to, to something very similar to this. So let's, let's think about this. Okay, what can go wrong in this red circle that goes up here? Well, how does this actually work? You know, things that we may or may not have seen at Coinbase, um, self-submitting forms, right? Uh, sometimes merchants require you to download some random HTML from, their, from an API server, asks you to embed it into your site and like self-submit it on behalf of the user, right? Cross-site scripting or HTML injection as a service uh, to integrate with these payment processors. All right, I'm, I'm happy. And then, well, okay, what about here? What do you think can go wrong? Well, this is like open redirect waiting to happen, right? Uh, how do I know that the payment processor isn't acting maliciously um, or isn't compromised and they get redirected to a phishing site that looks like their bank? 
Um, and now suddenly the merchant is playing a role because the merchant sent the user to the payment processor and now the payment processor is telling them to go to some phishing site. Right, so how do we actually ensure this, this integ the integrity of this? What about here? Can something happen? C-Surf. How will C-Surf show up here? Well, sometimes the banks don't actually require you to type in your username and password. They just say, you have a session with us already. Seems reasonable. Authorize the transaction. Um, it's, it's good and bad, right? It, it's a good payment experience. You don't have to go retype your credentials in, uh, which would maybe stop a lot of transactions. But like, it is still C-Surf. But do we care? Mm, it's the bank's problem at this point, uh, is what I say. But it's something to know, right? It's a lot of customers have asked us, hey, like, I didn't, I'm doing the 3DS flow, and I didn't have to type in my username and password at the bank. What's going on? And we're just like, your bank authorized the transaction. Like, we don't know any more information. Like, this is very opaque as a merchant. What can go wrong at this step? Lots of, lots of things. This is the most fun step, actually. Um, data quality, right? We talked about even in the ACH network, the XML files you get are just often just riddled with human errors, misspellings, you know, just accidental deletion of data. Same thing that can happen here, no, nothing different. Uh, XXE, right? If you have XML um, files, XXE is, uh, is an immediate concern. What else do we get? We get uh, deserialization bugs. So if you're you have these XML files and you're deserializing them into objects, so you can operate on the payment. Um, what about things, uh, you know, what happens if the API response you get back from the merchant um, says success but in includes an error code, right? Uh, what do you do then? Like the error code, it says it's an error, but it says it's a success. Like how do you respond to that? What about, how do these, uh, how does the payment processor authenticate to your service saying it's a successful payment? Uh, RDNS is something I've seen where, if you haven't heard of RDNS, it's reverse DNS. So they basically ask you to say, hey, what is the incoming IP? And then see if that IP points to the domain of your payment processor. Like, there's no authentication here. It's, it's bogus. Um, like, why not just include an API key and just call it a day? I don't know. Um, it really baffles me that some of the way these APIs are built. Um, it, it's it's like going through like archaeology. It's like all the mistakes we've done in the past. And it's like, let's just redo them in payments. It's great. Um, so that's, that's, that's one. Uh, what about here? Kind of at the payment processor when they're getting redirect back. Another open redirection bug, right? How do we make sure that the, that the payment processor is actually redirecting the user back to my site as the merchant and not to a phishing site that looks like the merchant, right? So we have to trust our payment processors yet again to make sure they're like doing all of this correctly. What about this final step? Race conditions? What about, so what happens instead of the money coming uh, in the middle here, I haven't actually quite received the money yet as the merchant, and yet the, the user has already landed back at my page. Am I accidentally just crediting them as soon as I get back onto you know, the landing page at the merchant site? Or am I actually waiting for this async process to kick off and finish, right? And asynchronous processing is like one of, you know, there's a lot of hard problems in CS. There's a joke about it, I won't say it again, but one of them is, I think there's another one there, it's called async processing. And so this is, you know, this is always another, another type of issue. What, another type of flow we've seen, sort of, you know, this backend integration is what happens if we're using URL, like URL parameters to indicate successful payment. So what that might look like, instead of this async processing going, we've seen you know, some sort of information in this redirect URL that gets passed indicating payment status and payment transaction. Um, and that gets thrown around right, uh, through each of these steps in the URL as like URL parameters. Right? So what is the issue here? Well, it's like, what are these, how are these URL parameters like, protected? Right? They're getting sent over in the browser. Are they encrypted somehow? Are they signed somehow? Are they properly signed, right? This is a whole key management system. Um, and basically, every single key management bug that you've seen in a lot of these talks regarding like JWTs and all these other things have been a problem that we've seen here, uh, where uh, just, you just see all sorts of issues with weak keys um, and, and uh, you know, bad algorithms, not using HMAC, just doing like, you know, basic hashing. Right? It's like, I haven't quite seen this bad, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody 
argued to me that base64 encoding was enough and that was equivalent to an HMAC. I've seen something just about as similar, but uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, what happens, um, so that was like the more advanced version, right? We have APIs, like woo. Uh, what we actually do see is a lot is SFTP buckets. Most of the financial industry is just running on SFTP buckets and just moving files around. Um, it's, it's really funny. And so what happens, so we're gonna talk about independent of auth flow, right? So we assume like any of these flows behind us, uh, right? The, we're mostly talking about how the money moves uh, rather than the authentication flow where the, the users are authenticating the transaction. Uh, so in this one, we're just gonna, we're gonna scope it down so I don't have to keep repeating myself. So here the bank is sending the payment processors some money. They send that to the SF, they basically upload some files to an SFTP bucket somewhere in the world that, you know, then your merchant pulls that down. Uh, and then they may send some sort of ACK message back in the bucket saying, hey, we downloaded the file, we've processed it, everything sounds good, and back and forth. Um, what's happened here? Uh, we've typically, like some issues we've seen, race conditions. Uh, sometimes we've seen, uh, you know, we're just not able to download the files in time and the connection times out on us. And then as part of that, the bank, or the processor may decide that, hey, you've read the file, you no longer need it on the SFTP bucket, we've deleted it. Um, and, but yet the merchant hasn't actually processed the payment. And so now you're in a situation where the customer believes they've paid the merchant, the, the merchant does not see the payment, and the payment processor says they sent it to the merchant, and nobody really knows what's happened. Uh, and this is where you get a lot of confusion in financial systems is because it's like, everything's like in these buckets. Uh, what also has happened, right, is typical app tech concerns. Like, what are the ACLs in place, right? Are these buckets shared between multiple merchants? Uh, generally, a lot of uh, companies will do that basic due diligence. Like, are they patched, right? Like, Equifax is on everybody's mind here, especially in, like, FinTech. Like, are we even patching these, these buckets? Like, does your security team know that they even exist? Um, that's happened. Well, uh, generally, though, the, the one positive thing is, like PGP encryption is like always an option. Like that, that is the one thing they have like figured out is like at least you can encrypt these files so that you're the only ones like, like the merchant is the only one that encrypts them. So worst come to worst, they like screw everything up. They screw the ACLs, they screw up um, networking conditions that you can access the bucket under um, kind of everything. You know, they don't patch the server at least if the files are encrypted. Other things that are interesting that we've seen is sometimes there's two files that get uploaded as part of every batch. One file indicates success, the other one indicates all the failed payments. Um, and why is that the case? I don't know, that's just their API. But what happens sometimes is that the order of the uploads matter, whereas the first one that gets uploaded is a successful, a successful payment, and the second one that gets uploaded is failed. You'd be thinking, that's kind of weird, and it is weird. And what's happening is that there's a human at the payment processor up manually uploading these files. So what happens when they switch the files? And suddenly, all the failed payments are now being called success, and all the successful payments are now being treated as fails because of the order that the files are uploaded in. Um, and so this cause also causes issues, right? It's just because of the amount of manual things that happen at the banking and payment processor layers that are very opaque, right? They hide it behind these fancy APIs, but the systems are not automated. They're like, they're, they're mostly human driven still. And so you run into all these sort of data quality issues um, that, that occurs from that. Uh, there's a last step that happens, which is like really cool. Uh, I appreciate accounting people for this. It's called reconciliation. This process basically means does my internal accounting as the merchant equal the external accounting that the payment processor says, right? This is a very good check. Like as a security person, I am like, thank you, accounting people. Like bless you, this is amazing. Uh, because this is the only way we can actually figure out like where money has ended up. And so that's, what this, it's pretty simple, actually. It's usually just an SFTP bucket, again, no surprise. Uh, they basically upload a bunch of data to the bucket saying, this is all the transactions we've seen in the last, you know, maybe day or week or month, and then I get sent, and then the merchant downloads it. But what's happening here is, what are your ACL controls, right? A lot of payments, uh, people are really focused on the payment network, and they don't actually focus on this bucket. And this bucket is often separate from the original bucket that had the payments. So if you're a security team, you're like, okay, where are the payments, right? 
But this one's usually out of scope. This one's usually hidden in some paperwork way down the line. And you're like, I don't really care because it doesn't have uh, the payment data. But it has a lot of PII in it, right? Because it's about the users who are moving money, right? It's not just like, you know, you got X dollars. It's like you got X dollars from Garfield. So, um, so there's, there's issues here, but this is usually is like, I generally consider this not just like an accounting control, but even like a security control to help us stop bleeding money. Because if we can identify mismatches in the accounting systems, then we know we're bleeding money. But there's issues here, right? In the sense that we've seen all the files coming through, there's been general data quality issues throughout this entire system. And this system is prone to that issue also. So you may not get 100% and you just have to say like, I hope we did well enough. Um, one other thing is, oh, this is talking about this, internal controls. So one thing is what happens when there's these sort of payment issues, we resolve through phone calls, right? This is the merchant calls up the bank and says, I have no idea what's going on, please help me troubleshoot. Um, and as part of that, the banks will, as part of setting up these connections, banks will often ask for like security questions, fantastic. What do these security questions often have? They're about the same level of security as the ones on every other site. What is your mother's maiden name? What is your birthday? What is your favorite childhood pet, right? The same things that are prone to social engineering. It's, and it's really interesting that the banks care so much about, you know, the PGP encryption and this and that, but yet they open up security questions to just be like, what is your mother's maiden name? Uh, and so what, you know, if you're in the security team, like, are you actually seeing what those files say when you're requesting the bank to open up this connection? Like, do you recommend that the team, instead of actually putting in their mother's maiden name, that they use a 64-bit, like 64-character random password completely? It's going to suck saying that over the phone, but that's better than you know a four-letter word of some sort, right? Because that just lets for all sorts of social engineering into the bank to get all this data that they shouldn't, that these people shouldn't have access to. Cool. So that was a little depressing. There's some hope. Um, but what can we do? What are, what are tools that we have uh, from the AppSec realm and how can we apply them into the payments world? I'm running-ish out of time. Okay. So we'll go quickly. So vendor reviews. Like this is so critical and it saved us from so many problems over the years at Coinbase. Um, and this is about, right, we talk a lot in the AppSec world about having strong partnerships with engineering teams. In this case, for payments, does your AppSec team have a strong connection with your business and procurement teams? Right? This is so critical. Right? Our team is often involved in figuring out which vendors to even integrate because we can evaluate their APIs like, right off the bat and saying, like, there's no hope for these people, or like, hey, we can actually make this work. And that, before we actually invest, before we sign any deals, we can actually do this due diligence like, way before. Um, and this also gives us good insight into engineering. What are things that you should be aware of when you're integrating against this like API? Things that can go wrong and giving that information right off the bat. And we've found like huge amounts of success here uh, um, on the AppSec team, All right? And so these are the three things, right? Like just read the API docs. You'd be surprised like how much information they give up in the API docs and you're just like, I can't believe you're authenticating that way. Like this makes no sense. And, um, it's, and it's like, it's, they just write it there. And it's, it's a really good resource to have. And it's just kind of like boring work, but you, you'd be very surprised at like the amount of issues that you can just sort of glean from reading these docs. Threat modeling, super important, even in this world, right? Um, in the same way that we're thinking about the vendor reviews, like what are your threat models internally? Um, when APIs are updated, when APIs are updated, how are you um, updating your own threat modeling internally, right? Because the idea is like, if you've modeled a system that existed at time A, you know, at A prime, what did your, are your modeling updated? Do your engineers know what controls to apply? And then are you automating testing against those controls, right? Um, so that way you don't have to be there for every single banking API change. And how are you, how are you fixing that? Static analysis is one that's important. Um, how do you prevent money and money? How do you prevent detecting? How are you preventing and detecting money loss issues before they appear? So one plus one, you would think it's two, but is it? What happens if it's a dollar and a cent? What happens when I add those two? It shouldn't be two dollars. It should be a dollar and one cent. But one plus one, there's no units attached to these systems, right? We, the units are so important. Uh, what about one dollar and one euro? 
Do I expect the, do I expect the end result to be in euros or dollars or some other like currency? I don't know. Um, it's not clear, right? Like, like these, these mistakes are very, when they do happen, they're very intentional of engineers not understanding the constraints of their system and like what the expected values or units of these systems are. Uh, point one to two float. Uh, don't do any accounting and floating point notation. Please, like you will suffer a lot of heartache. Uh, point one can't actually be represented as point one in floating point arithmetic. It's like point one, like, and then like five zeros, and there's a bunch of like stuff behind it. And that's just like the IEEE spec, right? What should be happening is that all of these are integers. You operate everything as an integer, and then you move the decimal place as you need at the last second. Um, so like for dollars, I'd recommend doing every, all your operations in cents, and then at the last minute, move the decimal place over. Um, because integer arithmetic is way more accurate than floating point arithmetic. Like floating point arithmetic was not built for like accounting. Like it's just not, please do not try. Uh, bug bounties. This is important for us as like we're operating as a company, right? Because like you may, as your company, may want to pay out the most for like a remote code execution bug, right? Like super cool, awesome. Like let's, let's get it fixed. But in a payments context, what I care about is the money loss bug, right? If you get RCE on a system that isn't related to payments, like, yeah, you, there's maybe some issue you can pivot into the environment. What I really care about is like, can you exploit any bug that loses me money? And then as part of your bug bounty program, are you paying up proportionally to that loss? Like, right, like if, if you're losing, you know, $500,000 on a bug, right? Are you at least, are you paying out like a thousand bucks for it? Like there's no incentive for like the hacker other than being nice to report that bug to you. Um, and so you'll see this a lot, right? I, I think there's some companies that have in, in the payment space that don't, haven't realized this, where like their top bounty is like $2,500 and they're processing billions of dollars a day. It's like, that's a joke. Like nobody's reporting a money loss bug because they just take the money and run and never tell you about it. Um, and so the encourage, like you really, like you do have to step up your game and pay a lot more for these types of, uh, the, these types of bounties. And then the other thing to take is like, when you do lose, you know, huge amounts of money in these bugs, uh, as you scale, like, bl like blameless retros is a thing we have at Coinbase, and I think it aptly applies here. And what that means is that engineers can naturally feel at fault, or even like security engineers can naturally feel at fault that you just lost the company a bunch of money. And it's important to focus on not who lost the money, but what went wrong and what controls went wrong and how do you fix it, because that's how your company stays sane. Um, otherwise, everybody would just quit. Security Champions is another uh, program we're rolling out to our payments team. Um, it's pretty new for us, and I think we're finding good success in the sense that our payments engineers know a lot about the business logic in these systems, and that I can help them with the core AppSec issues, right? So the open redirects and all of these things that we need to validate, uh, we can still do that. And we're finding really good success about like eliminating money loss bugs uh, at Coinbase. Cool, so in conclusion, uh, the things to keep in mind is define secure for your environment in these payment systems, right? It's not actually obvious what it is. I hope at least the definitions I provided of, you know, minimize money loss and like try to eliminate uh, any PII loss is like, is, I think it's a good definition. Uh, understand your payments network, right? You wouldn't be an AppSec engineer if you didn't understand the browser security model, right? In the same way, if you're integrating a payment system, understand the underlying payments networks because that will glean a lot of potential bugs that your vendor won't tell you about. And then apply the tools you know, right? We have all these tools from traditional AppSec. Think about what it means in a payments context. And then I think the last one, like be a partner to the business, right? I think this has been our most successful case at Coinbase where we work a lot with our business teams to, un to help identify like riskier payments partners and which ones are less risky and, and work to integrate with the less risky ones and the things that are doing things, the ones that are processing payments in like a sane manner. Cool, that's my talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, hope you enjoyed it and I've opened the questions. Thank you, that was really eye-opening, <laughs> some aspects of it. A, qu a question to yeah. you about financial data exchange. What are your thoughts about that uh, initiative? Do you think it's gonna be successful in US? And uh, yeah. 
financial data exchange? Yeah, so it's an uh, it's extension to the open banking. So it's like a lot of those big banks got together and uh, it's, uh, it used to be under a different name before and now they, I think, rebranded. So it's like a okay. US version of the open banking approach. Yeah. So I think the problem here is that everything the banks have tried to do is band-aids around the ACH system, right? It's like in order to fix some of these like issues, right? It's at the payment network level. And if you attended Mark's talk before, right? Some of the issues are like at the blockchain level, like no matter what the banks do above board, it doesn't matter. Like there are fundamental issues that aren't solved. And it's like, I don't see anything about like rewriting how the ACH system works um, and reinventing that because it moves so much money. They're like, don't, don't fix it if it's not broken. And nobody's saying it's broken because the Federal Reserve to just like inform you is like the, the Federal Reserve only studies numbers about customer fraud. They don't actually study any numbers about merchant fraud. Um, and so they just like, we don't know this is an issue because we never studied it and we don't care, right? Um, and so my opinion is like, whatever happens there, fine. Maybe things will be slightly better, but like there are still very fundamental issues that like can't be solved without like reinventing this. Yeah. Any others? All right, thank you.